Blockchains have been around for more than 15 years, and yet no one seems to know how to value them. Is there a standard formula that we can use to start valuing crypto assets? What metrics even matter? Is it fee revenue? Is it MEV? Or is it something else? That's what we discuss in today's episode with Michael Nato, founder of DeFi Report, someone who has been creating frameworks for investing in crypto for many, many years now. Michael also shares his favorite assets. He's investing in this cycle, so make sure to listen in for that. Welcome to Milk Road Radio, the easiest path to get smarter about crypto. I'm Kyle Reedhead, your host for today's show, and we believe that on-chain is the next online. This is the opportunity, and we're here to help you capitalize on it. Crypto will go up more than 100x in both users and value over the next decade. If you're listening to this right now, you're extremely early and have an incredible opportunity to capitalize. At Milk Road, our mission is to make you smarter about crypto. That's why we're doing today's podcast and why we send you a daily newsletter for free. But if you're ready to level up as an investor, then let me tell you about Milk Road Pro. We crafted this resource for investors who are already smart enough about crypto and are looking for more actionable insights on how to invest successfully in one of the fastest growing industries on earth. Every week, we break down the latest trends, dive into tokenomics of popular and up and coming tokens, and get into the nitty gritty of market analysis, all to help you invest smarter. Plus, we have a private Discord community for pro members. It's like your backstage pass to the Milk Road crew, exclusive insights, hot tips, and live AMAs with our team. Now, if you're looking to level up as an investor, then click the link in the show notes below and sign up to Pro Today. Don't let this bull market opportunity slip through your fingers. Mike, welcome to Milk Road Radio. It's great to have you here, man. Excited for this conversation. Great to be here, Kyle. Cool. Well, you've been writing some pretty incredible content with the DeFi Report, and I figured uh, we get you on because, well, there's a lot to talk about. One, the market has been a little bit crazy over the last few weeks, so I want to get your thoughts on that. But a big topic going on right now in, in the crypto space is how do we value blockchains, right? They've been around for long enough. We should have some sort of valuations, but I feel like everyone's opinions on this tend to be different. So I want to get sort of your thesis because you've been writing a lot about this and then just your overall thesis around the market and what's going on in this cycle. But before we get into that, let's just start with a bit of background of yourself. Walk us through kind of who you are and, and how you got to this point. Yeah, man. Uh, excited, to, excited to be here. Excited to chat with you. So yeah, real high level. Got into the space officially in 21. Was fortunate to be working at MIT's endowment back in 2017 to 2019. I was not smart enough to go to MIT. But I was there managing their, helping to manage their commercial real estate portfolio for the endowment. And we had a few Bitcoin people in the office. We were on campus. We were exposed to a lot of like cool research and innovation, the digital currency initiative. Our friend Gary Gensler was teaching about blockchain at MIT yeah. at that time. <laughs> so I was learning a lot at that time and then basically got obsessed with the space, fell into the rabbit hole like a lot of people. And then when a lot of these data providers started to come out, in really kind of 2020, 2021, that was when my interest really started to peak. And I started writing. So we started writing the DeFi report. I started working for a firm called Invenium, which is in the um, tokenization of real world asset space. So that's a startup. And just kind of had this little side hustle with the DeFi report, just doing my research. And it was really like the foundation of that is, is me as an investor with skin in the game, doing research and then sharing my research with the market. And kind of started to build a brand around that. And it kind of just turned into a business almost accidentally because I was just doing it as a side hustle and writing on LinkedIn. And I've been full time with the DeFi report now for about a year. And we do market insights, on-chain data, fundamental analysis, and we partner with, with the data companies. So we've kind of monetized that way, ultimately looking to build media and turn it into more of like a, a subscription business. So yeah, excited to, to talk about the markets. And you know, I do I, I live and breathe this stuff. So yeah, no doubt. I mean, your guys' reports are great. So it's, um, you know, great job on what you're doing with the DeFi report. Let's talk about the markets before we get into yep. valuations, because I, I, that is the meat of this conversation I think I want to get to. But a lot is going on in markets right now. Woke up this morning. Things weren't so great. We're recording on, on May 1st. For those that are wondering, I think this will come out about a week after. But we're about 47 days into a pullback, which has been, I think, I mean, it's not massive. We're now like 20% or 22%, I think, pullback in Bitcoin. It's not that big compared, like if you were here last cycle, we had way, way, way bigger. Yep. But walk me through just your analysis, what's happening right now in terms of this pullback, but then also maybe a little bit broader of where are we in the cycle? What does this all mean? And like, where do you think we're going from here? Yeah, I think that's the big question. We've seen a little little pullback here recently after a sustained period of strong price action for, for about six months. So to me, this is this is mostly expected. As you mentioned, it's like a 20% or so pullback right now. We may go to, to 30% or so here. 
if you look at past cycles, that's pretty much, you know, you're not just going to have a straight line all the way to a blow off top. So we expect to see some vol volatility here. My view is that you have a combination of the markets being spooked a little bit by inflation coming back slightly. We had a 3.5% print in the, in the U.S. So interest rates, the expectations were that we would be potentially be cutting rates at this point in the year. Those are being pushed out to, to later in the year. So I think that's broiling the markets a little bit. You've got stuff, you know, geopolitically going on. We've got some turmoil with the Japanese yen devaluing. We'll see see how that plays out. So there's sort of like, you know, there's a wall of worry out there, I would yeah. say right now. I don't think that this is like disruptive to the overall bull market cycle. If you look at various traders and stuff that will sort of identify sort of support zones out there, you know, we sort of just broke through a support zone at around 62,000 or so. I think the next one's in the 50 to 55 range. I think that may be where we're heading and, you know, alts, alts are down 60, 80%. So I, I view this as sort of a little like a shopping spree potentially for stuff that you have high conviction on for, for the rest of this cycle. So. Yeah, I very much see it the same. I think one, it is expected. And I think if you are aware of cycles and how this works, like this is pretty normal. And then I also think we're just sort of in the middle of the bull market right now, in my opinion, which generally we sort of lag out and there's like, so this like stagnation, you get pullbacks, but they're sort of long winded ones. Yep. And then the next part of the cycle, which is, I would say the, like the final part of the bull market is where things get a bit crazy. You have these very fast, aggressive pullbacks, um, but price goes up nuts. Uh, and I think we it generally takes a while to work through the price action until you get to that point. But I yep. think that is coming. But I think, I don't know, it could be weeks, could be months until I think we get there. What is your sort of thesis around this bull market? Is it a typical cycle like we've had in the past? And are you thinking, you know, maybe this thing tops out somewhere in 2025? Or is this something different? I would agree with you. I think my view is that we're early to mid cycle here. You know, we look at a ton of data points on this. And I'm happy to share sort of the, what those data points look like. But yeah, I believe we're sort of like mid cycle. And I agree with you that the aggressive price action will likely come in the second half of the cycle after we sort of chop people up uh, a little bit here to get there. But as far as like, are we, you know, is this going to be a super cycle? Is it going to be like a, a shorter, quicker cycle? Because we we did see Bitcoin, Bitcoin all time highs prior to the halving, which is the first time we've, we've seen that. My view is that this is going to be a longer cycle. Like we may see Bitcoin breach 100K this year. That wasn't my prediction at the beginning of the year. I thought we might get close, but maybe breach that next year and that the actually pr aggressive price action would probably be in 2025. So mm -hmm. unclear to me if that's going to be October of 2025, which is sort of would line up with the past few cycles, or if it's going to be potentially a little bit shorter, a little bit more aggressive this cycle. I don't believe in like the super cycle. I don't see that happening. I just don't think it fits with my worldview of just like human behavior, fear and greed, market cycles, monetary policy, fiscal policy, like just the way the world works. I don't think we're going to have like a super cycle. I do expect there to be somewhat of a blow off top and then a, a significant correction again. So, yeah, I, I mean, I would say we're already in a super cycle. It's just not... Right. Up yeah. only, you know what I mean? Like it's like the yeah. internet has been a super cycle for decades, but it has not been up only. We've had many big pullbacks along the way, and I think that yeah. just continues to happen in crypto. But we're in a secular trend, that's for sure. When it comes yeah. to crypto, all right. Let me ask you this question: ETH, Bitcoin, Soul. What are you most bullish on for? I guess this cycle. It's a great question. This is a great <laughs> question right now, and I, I historically have been mostly Bitcoin and ETH, and and personally in my portfolio, what I did was. I essentially rotated out of Bitcoin into Solana. We, we were bullish on Solana basically when the app, right after FTX went down last year, we wrote a post about it. Um, people can check that out. But that's been, you know, the trade of this cycle so far. The question from here is, is that going to continue? Is, is Sol going to continue to outperform ETH or, ETH or Bitcoin? That's sort of how I'm approaching it. Ethereum is hated right now. Uh, yeah. which makes me like Ethereum. The way I'm looking at ETH right now is it's hated. The challenge with ETH is you have all these L2s coming out and it's sort of like diluting where potential value can accrue. And I think that's hurting ETH a little bit. But at the same time, we are going to get an ETF, I believe, for Ethereum at some point. And my sort of thesis here is that Wall Street doesn't really invest in gold. They don't care about gold because it doesn't produce a yield. We're seeing interest in Bitcoin, 
despite Bitcoin not producing a yield. But when you have two options to get crypto exposure for these institutions, one of them produces a yield and one doesn't, I just have a hard time thinking that people are still going to be opting for the Bitcoin ETF if there's an ETH ETF. Mm -hmm. So when what we've typically seen in these cycles is Bitcoin leads the market early on. You, you have pretty significant price action with Bitcoin and Bitcoin's strengthens against the rest of the market, which we've sort of seen early in this cycle as well. And then Bitcoin's dominance falls later in the cycle and you get the rotation to ETH and, and, and to alts. What does that potential rotation look like if there's an Ethereum ETF? That may be a much bigger rotation than people are anticipating right now. And I think most of the market thinks it's actually going to be stronger, a stronger bull cycle for Bitcoin. So this is what I'm trying to process myself. I'm just sort of hedging it. I, I still hold a lot of ETH. I'm very bullish on ETH. The question is, is it going to outperform Sol? I think the market perception also is like always looking for the next new thing, right? So yeah. typically the new thing will outperform. It might not even be Sol. It might be something like Celestia or some other eigenlayer or something else that, you know, last cycle we had stuff like Terra Luna collapsed, but like that thing got up to what, 80 to 100 billion valuation. Yeah. Same thing for Solana. So there's probably going to be something new that comes in that has, I don't know, maybe a two to 10 billion valuation right now that that goes to those levels. But you can't Maker. go wrong. In, in my view, you can't really go wrong. Just, you know, sort of hedging yourself with those three assets if, right. if you're new and you're coming into the game. So yeah, agreed. Uh, I forgot that Terra Luna got that big, which is crazy because that's bigger than what Solana is right now. And yeah, like Solana right. is a way more important technology and has done so much more than what Terra ever did last cycle. And Solana right. is currently valued less than what Terra made it to last cycle. That is actually a little bit wild. Okay. Speaking of valuations, obviously in this space, we have no idea how to value anything because WorldCoin was valued at like 150 billion in terms of FDV just like a month ago, uh, which makes zero sense. And I think a lot of things in crypto make little sense, but we're beginning to make some sense of it all. So let's just talk about blockchain specifically. And for the listener, remember, not everything in crypto is the same. We call it cryptocurrency, but most of these things are actually not currencies. I would say blockchain tokens, like native blockchain tokens, like ETH for Ethereum or BTC for Bitcoin, Sol for Solana. These are currencies. These are native currencies of their blockchain. Right. But something like Maker or whatever else, any application token, this is not, it is something completely different. You could think of it more like a equity token or a governance token or something. So specifically blockchains and their native tokens, sure. how do you value those? Or what do you, maybe there is no way to completely value them, but like, how do you think through this when you're investing in something like ETH, Sol, Bitcoin, or even the smaller ones, as you mentioned, maybe Celestia, et cetera? Yeah, it's something I you know think a lot about. We work with these data providers. Everyone's trying to create standards around fundamental analysis. My thesis is that we are going to come to some sort of consensus on this. And like, if you go back in history and you look at the way the stock market's formed and like securities analysis and this like, idea of like intrinsic value, that is a social construct, right? It's mm -hmm. I think people forget that like somebody just sort of came up with that and then the market coalesced around it. And everyone said, that's the right idea. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to apply that for relative valuation. So I believe the same thing's going to happen for crypto assets. The question is like, what is that framework? And I put together a document called the Ethereum Investment Framework. It's got Ethereum in the name, but it sort of is pretty broad in the way that we approach just like the, the whole public blockchain space. And we go through different valuation methodologies in there. And we sort of proposed like four different ways to potentially do this. I don't think there's necessarily a, a right or a wrong way to do it, but I think you have to have some sort of framework. The first one that we that we go through in, in the Ethereum Investor Framework is total addressable market analysis, which is pretty standard in, in finance. You know, you look at sort of an industry or, or a new technology and you look at basically what percentage of other industries could this thing potentially capture? So we kind of go through and we map out growth, the growth of various industries. And then you kind of get to like a take rate for Ethereum. You apply uh, a discount rate to that. We run like different analysis, different scenario analysis on what the capture of the market that Ethereum would get. And you can run the same analysis for Solana or other L1 networks. So that's one, one way to do it. You can do a DCF. I don't think that's super useful with like an L1, just because the thing that you're trying to value is like priced in the, the native asset, right? So there's sort of like a yeah. circular 
logic. Explain um, what a DCF is real quick. Uh, discount cash flow analysis. Yeah. So basically what you're doing is you're projecting out, you're forecasting the revenues of Ethereum because there's a cash flow there. You're forecasting out what the growth rate of that could look like over a 10, 20 year period, applying a discount rate to those cash flows to get to like a present value of what that, that network could look like. So we run through that analysis also in the Ethereum investment framework, not super useful. Like I tend to think like if you're doing, if you're trying to compare anything with blockchains related to valuation and you're using analogies to existing frameworks, it's not the best way to do it, but you should still have that, have that analysis. The other way to do it is we look at price action through, through the cycles, and then we're comparing that to actual fundamental drivers of the price action. So active users and number of non-zero wallets and developer activity and like the, the basically operating metrics of okay. through the cycles. So we sort of map that forward to get to like a, a potential price for this cycle. And then you can just kind of do like a, a very high level extrapolation. So the crypto market got to about a $3 trillion valuation last, last cycle. You could start to look at that and say, okay, how much of that went to Bitcoin? How much of it went to like smart contract networks, how much of it went to other sectors. You could sort of forecast out what you think that growth rate could be for the next cycle and kind of back into some numbers there. Just a way to sort of get an idea of where things are going. But there's not consensus in the market, I would say, on what is the way to actually value these things. And like, in some respects, all four of those things are probably wrong. And like, the thing <laughs> that really just matters is like, is there demand for ETH? Sort of like, right. is there demand for dollars? When I think of like an L1, it comes back to the moneyness of the native asset. Why did the dollar just have this massive network effect? It, I believe it's because we priced like oil and dollars and there's like geopolitical reasons for this, but there's a constant bid on the dollar for these reasons. And if there's a constant bid on ETH, you have to sort of map forward, like what's going to be the reason that people want to hold ETH. So when you see like, L2s not, you know, pricing their transactions in their asset, but pricing them in ETH. When you see like the restaking and you need to hold ETH to access the yield from restaking solutions, you're creating demand for ETH. And that's the key thing to me. So I think other networks need to be thinking about that as well. And ETH is probably the strongest network in that regard. And we continue to see more and more ETH making its way into the ecosystem. So less on exchanges more in the ecosystem, which means it's becoming more capital efficient, which to me, that's the probably the proper way to think about this and not so much. And then maybe the yield on it and not so much trying to come up with a valuation, like just look at the yield and then that's like your PE basically or whatever it's paying you. So I want to go back into those demand drivers. I think that is really important. We also just released a pro report. I can't remember the title of it. Actually, it comes out this um, this week. So for those listening, it will have just came out. And it is basically all about the demand of ETH and why that is sort of the bull case yep. for ETH. And it sort of throws out all these different valuation models, which is interesting. You're like, we did all four of these different valuation models. And like the thing we realized is probably none of them are right. Right, right. <laughs> this is great. When you did those four, though, was there any that were close or that seemed like this is probably tracking the best? So, I mean, my view is like, it's useful to do this. You, you have to do the exercise to have a feel for like where we're going. My view is like the probably the most accurate way to do it is is with like either the cycle and kind of KPI comparisons and then the high level extrapolation. The total adjustable market, yes, useful, but like there's a lot of examples of people trying to do this for past technologies and just completely right. getting this wrong. Like there's a famous example of like Uber and people were trying to value Uber, like VCs were like laughing at the, the founders of Uber at, at what their valuation was early on. And they were like, you, get, you guys aren't worth more than the entire taxi industry. That was the totally the wrong way to think about like yeah. the potential value of something like Uber. So when you introduce a new technology and it has massive network effects, like comparing it to, to something else is, is probably not useful. But. I think it was Yahoo or AOL or someone did this with mobile phones too. They thought like yeah. a couple yeah. hundred thousand people or yeah. whatever were going to own phones. A McKinsey report it. or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so quite interesting. Yep. One of the things that's gained a, some serious, I guess, wind on Twitter was Token Terminal putting out a bunch of these like income statement reports and comparing, yep. I'm not sure you saw these, but comparing like ETH to SOL, SOL to Bitcoin, base mm -hmm. to SOL, and looking at revenues and expenses from blockchains, revenues being fees, and then expenses, expenses being inflation. And I think revenue was actually more specific to 
burn, as far as yep. I remember. You said, you know, looking at revenue is probably not super impactful. Is this helpful? Does this like help at all in your investment framework, for example, for ETH or for others? And does this matter for you for like when you chose what's going to be a better investment, Bitcoin, ETH, Soul? Like obviously, Soul, high inflation, not burning much Soul. Bitcoin, not high inflation, but burning nothing yep. and probably leaky value because it goes to miners, you need to sell it. Ethereum, well, they seem to have solved that, but like, does that even matter? And I feel like that's yep. a big debate now. What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what Token Terminal is doing is is trying to like create a standard for, for relative valuation, right? The market can right. decide if token incentives or consensus rewards are expenses. Like I've seen this sort of getting debated. I think it's kind of a like misnomer to even like, try to debate that like they're not traditional expenses we know that they're right their expenses i think the way i think of token incentives is at an expense i think of it as like if you are staking the asset it's not an expense to you because those are being paid that's actually yields to you similar to like if you were holding dollars versus somebody holding a treasury bond and the government's printing money the treasury bond holder is capturing that the person holding cash is, is basically losing it's, it's kind of the same concept it's an expense if you're not staking and it's potentially diluting you with Ethereum, that's being offset potentially by burn. And so you're not actually even being diluted if you're just holding ETH. But I mean, in general, I want to look at those things. I do want to look at it. I don't care what we call it, but I want to look at what is the token incentives or expenses, whatever we want to call it, and then compare Ethereum to Solana to Bitcoin. You mentioned like WorldCoin and stuff, these networks that have just a ton of you know future issuance coming. Like if you're an investor, you definitely need to be paying attention to this. If you're uh, a long-term investor, especially in as you go through it, like the cycle, like people that are holding that asset are, are going to be selling into selling into it. That's not necessarily the token incentives, but yeah, that's my view. We need something for relative comparison. What we call it doesn't really matter. That's right. kind of my view. Okay, interesting. Yeah. I mean, fees. I feel like. It definitely plays a role in the demand side as well, right? Like obviously supply matters for ETH because it's burning, but mm -hmm. it's not the biggest amount. It's not going to make like a massive difference in like in that very moment. Yep. But I think the burning of ETH and the ability for ETH to drive, like basically to create yield from activity is a driver for demand because people want to hold something that, that has yield, as you said at the beginning. Yep. And so I think Solana obviously has that too. My one question or my the thing I'm unsure of when it comes to blockchains is like what happens with fees long term like probably they all go very like not zero but they go down and it becomes sort of commoditized or do you think what are your thoughts around the fee structure yeah. of blockchains great question and this is be going to become more of a topic of discussion i think with ethereum as as it continues to build out in this like modular format because you could look at ethereum i'm saying ethereum but you could apply this to solana uh, as well when you look at it it's like well how should you think about Ethereum? One way to think about this is you have all these applications, all these L2s, other applications on top. They're all paying for block space and to, to settle down to Ethereum today. So you can almost look at Ethereum as like you're buying an index fund that yeah. has a high growth index fund. And like we're rotating new L2s, new apps and stuff into it, just like if you were buying S&P 500 or something. That's like one sort of, I guess, framework here. The challenge is that now we have data availability networks coming in and some of these l2s like celestia for example that's just making the the most of that cost and, and the value capture of ethereum is data availability cost and so when you introduce something like celestia and the l2 is using celestia for data availability there's much less value that's going down to ethereum at the base layer so how what does that look like as if that continues to sort of scale out does ethereum just start to sort of wither away, like all the value starts going to the data availability layer or the L2s. My like, I guess, mental model for this is that if Celestia and these other data availability networks do get adopted and they they essentially are making it way more efficient for L2s to scale block space, I believe that, that you're basically opening up a ton of supply of block space. And mm -hmm. what should happen and what has happened in past technology movements is that supply is met by new demand for new use cases. Right. So you, you should see like Web2 builders come in and be like, oh, wow, I can build something on an L2 that I used to not be able to because it's really cheap to do it now. And so does that end up driving enough transactions over time that it actually replaces, it sort of backfills what you lost at Ethereum because the volume is just going so much higher. 
that's kind of my mental model. So in the interim, I do think you may see like Ethereum sort of start to lose a little bit of its revenue capture. How does the market perceive that is the question, right? If the market starts to say, oh, wait a minute, Ethereum's a commodity, let's invest in the L2s and data availability, that could start to get interesting. I do think like these things are commodities at the end of the day. And so that could play out. That's sort of my, I guess, my my framework for that right now. That makes interesting. sense. Interesting. I completely agree. I mean, it's kind of like what happened with the internet is before we got broadband, we built up all this like fiber and there was just no demand for it. Didn't get yeah. used. It was just kind of right. sitting there. And then all of a sudden, you know, a bunch of big things happened on the internet and everyone started using it. And that we were like, oh shit, that's not even enough now. Now we need to build right. more and we need, you know, 4G, we need this, we need that. And we keep kind of hitting these limits and you got to, and I think the same thing, I mean, it, does, it makes sense that the same thing will happen with blockchains. The question is, how does that value then come back to the that native token and, and does it grow as a result of that? I think it's pretty clear that on blockchains, like I would assume if there's more activity on a blockchain over time, then that native token is going to get demand because you either want to hold it to help secure the network and get yield, or you need to hold it to spend gas with it or to deploy yep. contracts or to do whatever, right? So it, it does make sense that as those ecosystems grow, the token should grow along with it. Now, is that because of fees or something else? I'm not sure. The other one that is kind of like uncertainty right now is, well, what about MEV? I think a lot of people don't really talk about this one unless you're really in the weeds. So yep. I'm not sure if this is an area that you've looked in as well, but I've seen some people like Kyle Samani from Multichain Capital saying, hey, fees don't actually matter. It's all about MEV. And this is real revenue for a blockchain. Do you have a, a thought on that as well? I'm curious, what is what is he saying basically? What is maybe if you could articulate what his stance is on this, I could respond to it. I, I'm not sure what his take is on, on it. I mean, MEV is certainly like a, a major part of value capture of, of these L1s, but I'm curious like what he's where he's going with that on, on terms of valuation. I, I think he's basically saying like fees will be commoditized and basically go down to like kind of zero type thing okay. as we as we scale. But MEV continues, and that is a way for validators and stuff to okay. to make revenue. Yep. And if you look, Ethereum's MEV has kind of remained the same, but Solana's is just absolutely going nuts over the last few months. And so he sees that as the real growth revenue factor, and fees probably not so much. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, if you think about MEV too, like what is Google? Like Google's basically MEV. Like MEV is just you're in a posi powerful position, and somebody wants to essentially pay you to get into that position or, or get access to something that, that you have. Basically, Google is, you know, Google advertising is, is essentially MEV. And like, right. I could see that happening. That's um, That's yeah, I could see that happening, like where fees, use, user fees just end up at zero. There's so much richness to all the data and everything that's happening on these public blockchains, especially for finance, that, you know, there's just an incredible amount of value within all of that data. And people pay for to get in front of a trade or to you know what that's basically how, how it plays out I, I i think that makes sense that was a great way to explain mev by the way i haven't heard yeah. it explained that yeah. way but it's a good yeah. uh, it's a good analogy actually yeah. i yeah. really like that is there anything more you want to add on the sort of valuation side of, of l1s or did we sort of cover most of the bases i think that is i mean the high level people can check out the ethereum investor fair we put some price targets in there i won't i won't give them out right now so hopefully people download the report but people can check it out we did put price targets using these methodologies you know, my view is that I try to take a humble, humble approach to it that like yeah. nobody knows the answer and we're doing the analysis, but nobody has the answer and that over time we'll get consensus over time. It might not, it might be after regulation that that actually plays out. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, definitely check that out if you want to see yeah. his, his recommendations there. Okay, let's go to L2s. So obviously this has been a massive narrative and there's yeah. tons of activity going on in L2s and lots of lots of L2s and L3s even now launching. And it seems like it's going to be an important design space. And it's where a lot of the Ethereum mind share is moving to. And whether that takes away value to the ETH token is kind of, we're not really sure, we'll see. But what are your thoughts around L2 tokens? And maybe also your thoughts around the L2 landscape. Are we gonna have millions of these things? Are they all gonna accrue value? Is it going to be just a few or just like these tokens are kind of useless and all the value goes back to, to ETH? What's your sort of thoughts around how this all plays out? So not super bullish on the L2. I mean, I, I like the way Ethereum is scaling. We're doing it with L2s. You've got basically a couple like general purpose L2s that are the larger ones, Arbitrum, Optimism. You've got like ZK Sync and StarkNet and a few others. And there's a million of these things. And there's probably going to be many, many, many more. The mental model I take with like L2s is like they could sort of take the form of specific use cases 
potentially geographic regions. Like if we do end up with like a massive network effect around Ethereum and it, and it really takes hold, like you could have an L2 that just services like the APAC region or, you know, there's different reasons for this, different laws, jurisdictions. That's kind of my framework for L2 is like, I think if you, as an investor, you're probably better off buying ETH. And this is sort of how I've done this in my portfolio. I do own a, a little bit of a couple of the general purpose L2s from, but most of it is in ETH. And the reason for this is like, just from a risk adjusted perspective, I view it as like, you can buy ETH and you're buying basically like, to me, it's kind of like buying the S&P 500, but it's a growth thing. It's not like you're just going to capture 10%. It's, it's got growth to it and you can stake the asset. You, you can do that or you can try to pick amongst a number of L2s. That's sort of like stock picking to me. Yeah. So I do think there's going to be value there. The token is basically you know, a governance token today for these things. Does that change um, in the future? That's I don't have a strong, strong take on that right now. But as far as like for my my portfolio personally, I think from a risk adjusted perspective, you're better off just just buying ETH and yeah. capturing the fees from that are coming from L2s. So, yeah, I agree. I, I mean, I hold a few L2 tokens, but it, it's actually just because I was airdropped them and I've, I've sold like half of it, and then I yeah. kind of leave the rest and see what happens. But yeah. it's kind of hard to figure out what's going to happen with those. There's just so many, and I mean, it's obvious right now. Optimism and Arbitrum have the big lead, but do they keep that? Like, I don't know. I, there's definitely not necessarily a moat there, except for these ones that are building kind of the super chains, which you would have Polygon Arbitrum and Optimism are the, the three yeah. kind of ones doing that. But again, how does value accrue? We're not really sure. And so it feels like it's priced by narrative, not really yeah. anything else. It, it could be a bull cycle play, but I don't see it as like necessarily a long-term hold. At least that's, that's yeah. my thought. Do you think then that most of the value either accrues to the L1 token or to the applications that are actually bringing in all the users and generating revenue, like a, a maker, for example? Or do you think even application tokens don't accrue a lot of value? Um, good question. Well, maybe just one more point on on Ethereum and like the L2 stuff. If you want to try to cap one way that I think you could potentially capture some of the L2 trade is Coinbase and basically what they're doing with it. You could buy Coinbase stock and capture because base i actually think what they're doing with base is like a winning strategy and like they don't even have a token on base but obviously coinbase is capturing capturing those fees and i just like what coinbase is doing there but going back to to the question on what was the, qu the next question so i call them application tokens which oh, probably value cool, like, yeah. Yep. yeah so value cool for for the applications the use cases that exist on chain are they going to accrue any value obviously there's like you can turn on a fee switch for like uniswap and that but like where's the value really going to go is it to these application tokens is it l2s which you seem to be bearish on or is it just all go to the l1 in the end it's great i mean the DeFi sector i've been writing a little bit about this like has probably the best product market fit when you look at the DeFi, like ogs maker you mentioned uniswap lido like especially within the ethereum area ecosystem like there's product market fit there. When you look at fundamentals, there's probably a couple protocols that could do a billion dollars in, in revenue. You're right. That's not market cap. That's a billion dollars in revenue in the next year. So there's there's real value there. The, the challenge is that their governance tokens, there's no way to capture that in the same way that you can just by holding ETH and, and staking ETH. And so to me, this is potentially like a problem with regulation that's like sort of like throttling the ability for these things to capture value. It's kind of sad. It's in my view, like this is pushing people to meme coins and like other like scams potentially because we, we don't right. we don't have regulation around the things that actually matter. And we're, instead, we're suing these companies. So it's it's pretty disappointing. My view on like, I guess, just general value accrual is sort of this is kind of like the fat protocol thesis, like most of the value is going to L1s. I think that, you know, has held true over time. Is it going to hold true in the real, really long arc? I think value is going to move up up the stack. And ultimately, at the end of the day, th this stuff does sort of get commoditized. It doesn't mean it's worthless. It does start to get commoditized and the, the growth starts to tail off. And most of that value does accrue to the applications that have the relationship with the user. Stuff like Uniswap that does have that, they have fundamental economics underneath with the protocol. And they also have a relationship with the user via the wallet, via their interface, which is pretty popular. I am looking at, like, I think, Uniswap, because it's so hated right now, and it produces quite a bit of volume and, and cash flow, these things are interesting at, at these levels. Maker has made a big move 
already this cycle. There's a, there's a lot going there. So I, I think it's worthwhile to be looking at the like that space right now. Do you um, think it needs the fee switch though for them to really make it to the big leagues? Let's call it. Yes, I do. I do. I just think people are better. You're you're better off going with something like ETH and, and capturing your you know those things are driving value back to ETH, so you can capture the value there. And yeah, maybe post regulation, these things ultimately see their their true potential. Yeah, I I can't see any of these tokens really gaining sustainably large valuations until there is revenue coming back to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because like right now, like you said, they're basically all governance tokens. Doesn't matter how you spin it. That's basically what they are. And like not enough people really care to govern a protocol. And even if they do care, they're probably not going to want to hold hundreds of millions of dollars worth just to govern a protocol. But in some point when these protocols that are completely decentralized, like you said, lower down on the tech stack, something like a maker or a Uniswap that eventually becomes completely decentralized and they're just generating a shit ton of cash and they can find a way to get that back to the token holders. I don't know why anyone would ever hold an equity when that exists. You know what I mean? Like you hold an equity because you're hoping that this is, that company is going to do well, but you've got to rely on a board and you've got to rely on people, et cetera. And if I can just rely on a protocol and I can watch it all live on chain, I'm never touching an equity ever again. So I always say, I think the super cycle happens when we figure out how to accrue value to the tokens of applications that are generating like real large sums of revenue. Yeah. And we're not quite there. And like you said, it's probably because of regulation. We'll see if that happens or changes from this cycle. And if not, then I think once again, we have another cycle where it's just the L1s, the major L1s that sort of hold any meaningful type of value. Yep. Yeah. And then flashy new things will will accrue value, but it'll be sort of up and down. And yeah, that's kind of, I I would agree with that. Interesting. Okay. Let's um, maybe move away from the more fundamental valuation stuff. And let's just have a little bit more fun because that's what crypto is all about. And let's talk about the cycle. Do you play or invest? I know you said you're more of a long-term trader, so maybe not, but do you care much about the narratives and the like, hot use cases like, I don't know, AI and crypto, or I don't know, restaking, like all these things that kind of drive a big narrative and the people kind of FOMO into a bunch of these tokens. And maybe at some point they they build something great from it, but they're yeah. obviously super, super early in it making any difference in the world today. Yeah. Do you play around in this? Do you care about this? And if so, what are the use cases or the narratives that, you, that you're really eyeing right now? So I think the AI stuff is pretty over overhyped and like we tend to do this, like usually my view on the stuff that gets a lot of attention, a lot of hype is that it will always, the market will always overshoot it and it'll be a bubble. But just because something's a bubble doesn't mean it's, there isn't something real there. So like, yeah. I, I think the, my approach when you see these like mini bubbles, something like AI coins and stuff is to just watch. Don't FOMO. I try not to FOMO into these things, but I'll, I will watch it. And then maybe in the bear, you do real deep fundamental analysis and you, maybe you make some bets there. So yeah. I'm not in any of that stuff. I do think deep in is super interesting. And in some ways you could say like all of these networks are deep in if you really kind of get into it. But yeah. I really like the way that what Hive Mapper is doing. We wrote a piece on Hive Mapper recently. So people can check that out if they're interested. What they're building and it has a token and like it just makes sense. Like everything that they're doing, they're using the token to bootstrap a global network of drivers to essentially map the world. And they're doing it at a much faster pace than what Google was able to do. There's a, a flywheel, you know, with the token and, and value accrual back to that token with this project. So I think that's interesting. You will see if that catches the narrative. It does have a lot of token unlocks, you know, coming. Yeah. So that's one concern with, with a project like this that's still pretty early and the float is still pretty low out there. The thing the I like stuff. about Hive Mapper, though, uh, before you continue, yep. is it's not just a faster way to bootstrap versus Google. It actually creates a better product because yep. they can have like live updates of right. the map, which Google cannot do in their with their fleet of cars. It actually then results in a much better product, which probably unlocks new use cases and new apps that can't exist with the maps that Google or Apple, et cetera, provide. That to me is where I was like, oh, Hive Mapper is doing something really, really cool. And that's not possible without a token to actually drive the incentives for people yep. to make that product better. But I agree in terms of flow yep. and like, is this investable now? I don't know. Yep. But I see the future of like, oh, this thing is actually a way better product. And that's the thing that excites me. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Great point there. Yeah. And I think I'm not a meme coin. I bought my first meme coin, Bonk, like in Q4, yeah, just because I saw oh, yeah. like I saw somebody talking about it. And I just like that just kind of makes sense. It's culture. Like it, maybe it maybe it ends up getting repriced, similar to the big meme coins on Ethereum. So I, I own some Bonk. I I also think we're in an election cycle, 
and I don't want to get too like over anal analytical with this, but like we are in an election cycle. And I think that there's a chance that these meme coins that are tied to like politics, like the Bowdoin coin or the Trump coin is potentially interesting here, especially at like these levels where it's, you know, sold off pretty significantly. So those are maybe hopefully a little alpha potentially for people. I think I could see that sort of catching on in an election cycle. And then bridging is one area that's a little, maybe a little more boring for people. But as these ecosystems continue to build out, we're seeing more like bridges were a major problem in the last cycle. That's where all the hacks were. That's where a lot of the issues were. I think that ecosystem is maturing. And if we do end up, I believe we're going to have a multi-chain future here. Bridges are going to be a, a pretty big player in that. And so I'm looking at the bridging area, looking for value potentially in there. There's one called the cross that I've been looking into. We're probably going to cover it on the DeFi report. So those are a couple couple areas. And then maybe not like a token or anything, but like I just think in an area that's just super interesting to me is the way that Bitcoin mining and energy, like the collision between Bitcoin mining and energy is just like a super fascinating space just to study. Maybe not for, for like investing, but just to study. So interesting yeah really cool it, it's funny there's um when you bring up the political meme coins you can go into this fundamentals of like oh these products are going to change the world and then you can go into these like like this thing's really stupid but it's probably going to do really well because yeah. we're in election year you know <laughs> <Pattern> <laughs> such a don't overthink yeah. it yeah don't overthink it like you know people love sort of politics like there's a reason that like snl is constantly making fun of politicians and everything like i just see that kind of playing out with a token potentially so we'll see we'll see Money. Yeah, I completely agree too. Okay. As we wrap up here, I just want to ask one more question, which is we sort of talked about your timelines around this cycle. You said maybe even a little bit longer than 2025. Yep. What are the things you look for where you're like, okay, you know, we, we mentioned already, we're probably early to the middle part of this bull market. What do you look for when you're like, okay, it's probably time to get out of the market. Like things are getting a bit toppy here. What are your signals? Yeah. So typically I'm looking at Glassnode has a lot of good signals here and it's mostly Bitcoin. So I mostly, and we do a lot of like cycle awareness updates. We use Bitcoin data for this because Bitcoin tends to drive the market and, and everything kind of falls off of that. So what I'm looking for is like certain metrics, like MVRV ratio. I'm looking at long-term behaviors. Are they selling? Are, are you seeing like the, the percentage of the network that's held by long-term holders, like significantly dropping? basically the smart money starting to exit. That's a sign. Bitcoin dominance is another like factor that I tend, tend to look at. I'm looking at funding rates, open interest just to see like if the things are just getting like way over out over its skis. And then you have like the retail stuff that you can look at, like what's happening with Coinbase. You know, last cycle, the Coinbase app, everyone kind of knows this went to number one. So you can, you can track that. I think there's a, a Twitter account that's, that's tracking that. So I put on notifications. For that what else there's you could kind of get a feel for things by observing popular youtube channels and how many views like is it you're looking for like a wave of new people coming into crypto and usually when at the peak of that is sort of the peak of the mania so those are a few indicators awesome. right yeah super helpful yep. love it we're very in line with a lot of our analysis so it was great yep. to have you nice. on it was great to learn from you and and confirm a lot of things that i think I've been hypothesizing as well. So this is really good. Yep. If others want to learn from you and keep up with you, where can they where can they find you? Yeah, so, so I'm on LinkedIn every day. We're on Twitter as well. You can find, just Google Mike, Michael Nato LinkedIn at Just Do It on Twitter. And um, the DeFi report, you can just Google the DeFi report. We do a lot of free, all the research is free. So we have a lot of research up on up there. And then we have the podcast, the Signal podcast as well. So this awesome. is fun, man. We'll put the, yeah, we'll put the links to those in the show notes. Listeners, thanks so much for, for joining us today. Michael, thank you for coming on and sharing your wisdom. It was uh, very helpful and we'll have to get you back on uh, again in the future. Yeah, we'd love to. Thanks, man. Cool. All right, take care and have a good one, everyone. We'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for listening to Milk Road Radio, the easiest path to get smarter about crypto. If you like this episode, share it and hit subscribe or follow so you don't miss out on the next one. There's also a link in the description to our free five-minute daily newsletter where we simplify crypto for you while making you laugh. And if you're willing to step up your crypto investing game, then we'll leave a link to Milk Road Pro as well, your number one resource to help you invest successfully in crypto. One final note, this podcast is for educational purposes purposes only and nothing we say is financial advice. Crypto is risky, so you should never invest more than you're willing to lose. Thank you, friends, and we'll see you in the next one.